People in the building industry use a variety of software, right? Some are beam focused, some are not. But what's the best combination of tools to maximize efficiency? That's exactly what we are diving into today. A while ago, I made a video titled Revit versus Archicad. Which one do we use? If you've seen it, you know it was a bit of a tongue in cheek because my final answer was we don't use either. Instead, for a highly complex project like this spherical TV screen in Las Vegas, we relied solely on Rhino to generate all the 3D elements and CNC files for fabrication. Uh, but let's be real, most of us don't spend our uh, days designing spaceship-like structures. For normal projects, many assume Revit or Archicad or similar software is the obvious choice. Well, yes and no. Over the last few years, I've worked uh, much more with architects than fabricators compared to before. And I've grown to appreciate the power of BIM software like Revit, especially for documentation and collaboration. Uh, but here is my key realization. Uh, Revit treats your project as a database. I develop a lot of Revit plugins using C Sharp. You can watch my videos where I show you how to create your first Revit plugin, Revit plugin from scratch. And I also have a full 10 hour Rhino developer C Sharp course that you can access on the gasworld.com all for free. But let's get back to the subject. As I said, I write a lot of Revit plugins for to automate plan generation, manage element properties, generate sheets and so on. That's fantastic and Revit API provides great uh, built-in tools for that. But the moment I need to do any serious geometric operations, bam, I hit a wall. Sure, the Revit API has some basic intersection tools and some geometry handling, but let's be honest, it's extremely limited. Now, enter Rhino. Now, if I need to perform any complex geometric operations like automated generation of joints for my gas software, again, more about that in the description. And yes, what you're looking at are full joints generated at the click of a button. So if I need to do something like that, Rhino's API is packed with the tools I need. I rarely hit a wall. So here's my view and let's repeat the mantra together. Revit is a database, Rhino is a geometry engine. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could combine these two in a seamless workflow? Oh wait, we can. Thanks to the forward-thinking minds at McNeil Rhino inside Revit makes this possible. So if some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, here is a very short overview. People at McNeil uh, developed a concept called Rhino Inside that packed the entire Rhino into a DLL so you can open it within some other software almost as a plugin. In that way, you're basically creating a live link between the database and functions of both software solutions. So for Rhino inside Revit, that means that using Grasshopper for parametric design, you will get a ton of functions represented by these icons here that can work with Revit elements. Add columns, slabs, walls, grid lines, levels, create plans, sheets, so it can read elements their geometry and their properties and create elements, again, geometry, properties, whatever. So that is the shortest introduction possible. I might make a longer one in the future, uh, but this isn't a Rhino Inside tutorial. There are plenty of those uh, out there. I want to help you understand why you should use it and the benefits it would bring. Now, when collaborating with architects, I use Rhino Inside Revit extensively, actually. I've created custom grasshopper components that allow us to generate entire buildings inside Revit with few components. Now, that being said, I will admit this video is a little bit of a tutorial in the sense that I will talk about uh, workflow, my ultimate workflow co for cooperation with architects. Again, not fabricators, uh, there most of the time. Rhino, for me, Rhino only is good enough and I will talk about it in other videos. But if we talk about design stages and architectural work, here is what I do. Step one is to create a 3D wireframe. So what I call a 3D wireframe is essentially a set of grid lines, 2D, and levels, 3D. So these define a framework of planes in three directions, allowing all building elements to be positioned precisely according to them. So, Again, I don't want you to miss this because this is the core idea. The idea is that I position every single element, every column, wall, window, chair, in relation to this 3D wireframe, to one or two grid lines and to one or multiple levels. Now, once we have this 3D wi wireframe, uh, we generate geometry. 
The wireframe is usually created in Revit. I can very easily create all the grid lines and levels using Rhino Grasshopper as well and Rhino Inside, because Rhino Inside Revit provides us with those tools. But I'm telling you the version of the workflow that I often use and that makes the most sense. Because if you set this up in Revit, others in the team can go on and work with the file in parallel. So we set up the grid and we set up the levels. Now, in Grasshopper, we read those grid lines and levels, then use them to position the elements. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was enough talk. Let's move to the desktop of an actual computational designer just so that I can show you how that looks in practice. Let's see, the designer is querying grids. He's querying grids from Revit. That means he's going to read some of the uh, Revit grids. And there they are. We can see them in the viewport, uh, Rhino viewport. Now, what do we want? We want the element curves of those grids, right? So we plug in the elements and we get the curves or the lines. We want the element names. What, what do we get? We get the names of those grids. Okay, very simple. Two, three components. Let's see what he's going to do next. Um, now he has a special component of his own where he can input those lines and names and he can split them in two directions. Let's see, if he explodes the lines and explodes the names, you will see he has two branches on each of those explosions and there they are, the names in one direction and the names of grids in another direction and the curves are split the same, great. That's what we need. We need the lines in the X and the Y direction. So now he has a special component where he will uh, select a path for a new Excel file and then he will simply export those grids together with those names into an Excel file. This is how it looks. It forms an Excel file. So he chose to use an Excel file to mark the positions of his future columns. He's doing that by putting access there. Very interesting. So what is he going to do now? He is going to use that Excel file with those positions. He's going to select it. Yes, that's what he's doing and connected it. And now I'm guessing he has a special component, of course, yes, that, that reads all of that data. Wow, there's levels there, there is grids, offsets. What does he have here? He has codes. He's showing us that these X's are written as codes because he can actually type uh, type the the name of the, the family type that he wants or he can put offsets in x y z direction or rotation and uh, uh, for each individual column thus regulating and and uh, controlling each individual column like that he also has levels as the name of the sheet that's nice the story can control uh, between each which levels are the columns and of course these are the intersections those x's represents the tuples of uh, X and Y uh, grids, where the intersections of those are. So now he has a special component again, of course, where will, he will put those intersections from the Excel table and he will get actual points where those intersections are. A uh, pretty neat idea. Let's see. Here are the intersection of the columns, but the points are not enough. So let's see what he will do. He will uh, get the levels, all the levels from the Revit file. He will get all the identities from the lev uh, levels, which means we had get the names and elevations and so on. And of course, he has a special component where he will put those intersection points, the levels and their names. And from that Excel table, the levels at the bottom and the top of columns, remember those that were in the sheet name, so that he can make multiple sheets for multiple levels if needed. And then he has all the lines. So what does he need? He needs a type of the column. He just chooses the family type and he adds a structural column, connects those lines, connects the type, and that's it. So this was a pretty nice preview of how an actual computational designer with custom-made components can create a system where entire all the elements could be saved in an Excel table or in any type of uh, other type of uh, a way, maybe parametrically generated as well, and then uh, populated for the entire building. Nice to see. Now, what I'm talking about is here is creating basic geometry. In case of columns, those are simple lines, right? And once our geometry engine, Rhino, generates these elements, we then introduce BIM data. On the Revit side, what we did was we created all the families that we needed to populate our elements. And then we assigned the correct family types to our lines and voila, our ge geometry is now full-fledged beam elements. From here, we basically unlock the full power then of Revit's documentation capabilities. Plans, sections, schedules, all is there, all in place. And this workflow aligns with my core gas philosophy. 
store only element positions, populate full geometry when and where needed, and control the level of detail dynamically. More about the level of detail, of course, in the gas videos, not here. But if you think about those weird concepts drawn from the quantum mechanics that tell us that the wave function, function collapses only if there is an observer looking at something, well, I want those same principles of optimization. Give me only what I need when I need it, when I need to look at it. Uh, I said that, uh, that we're going to talk about LOD in other gas uh, videos, but I'm just going to mention it here. With this approach, we can always return to Rhino to refine the connections and generate precise construction details, down to the holes, pockets, bolts, nuts. And this is where uh, gas software comes into play. But again, that's a topic for another day and another video. Uh, what is the main takeaway here? Let's sum this all up. Revit is a database, Rhino is a geometry engine, right? Revit is a database for me, Rhino is a geometry engine. Rhino inside Revit then allows us to use the right tool for the right job. But what about other software out there? Am I saying only use Rhino or Revit or? Of course not, not necessarily. And you can see that in my videos, I talk a lot about other software as well. Let's take Blender, for example. It's an excellent geometry engine. I haven't explored deeply. 3D Studio Max, Maya, ZBrush, fantastic for working with meshes, polygons, ideal for movies, video games, but not for architectural precision, not always. And the real message is use the right combination of tools for the right task. So I would love to hear from you in the comments what software combinations do you use and do you agree with this division of roles? Let me know in the comments and uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to check out the gasworld.com, first of all, for 10 plus hours of free Rhino C Sharp development training, but also for the gas software that uh, does a lot of these things mentioned. And uh, stay tuned uh, for the upcoming gas software launches, work hard, be like water, and most importantly, stay free.